Um, and um, I'm very excited that we have with us Bonnie Fitzgerald. She is the founder and owner of Maverick Mosaics in Virginia. She is an artist, an educator, and an author. And she is a popular instructor um, of art, of mosaic art, and has taught, taught hundreds of students throughout North America. Um, she is the resident instructor of mosaics for the Smithsonian Institution's Studio Art Department in Washington, D.C. And um, she has written several books, um, 300 plus mosaic tips, techniques, um, templates, and trade secrets, and Bonnie Fitzgerald Guide to Mosaic Techniques. We're really pleased to have Bonnie join us this evening. So Bonnie, let's get started. All righty. Uh, well, for starters, I want to want to. I'm just so impressed at how many of you are out there and interested in in this topic and the mosaics, and that you actually have an organized group that um, does educational things. It's it's not a small feat to keep organized and motivated. Um, so that's great. This is. Um, a really popular topic. I probably get more requests to talk about exterior mosaics and fabrication techniques than any other topic um, because we, we want to take our stuff outside. So let's just get started. I, I, I hope this covers all that you want. Um, please do put your questions in the chat and we'll try and get to as many of those as we can. And if I'm talking too fast, like send a chat in that box so that um, Amy cues me to slow down because it's a lot of information. I would just want to make sure that, that you're digesting it all. So let's see here. And I'm kind of new at Zoom. I've only been doing it for two months like the rest of us. So um, bear with me. Uh, so exterior mosaics. So the whole trick to exterior mosaics is that the materials are rated for your climate and they're, um, they're combinable with a suitable substrate and proper adhesive. And if you have all those things happening, you're gonna have a, a successful artwork and installation. So just uh, some quick homework, some quick housekeeping. Um, how do I test if something's rated for freeze thaw? So in the world of tessera of your material, ceramic, glass, whatever that's gonna be, it has to be vitrified. So vitrification basically is the transformation of a material into a glass. Um, so basically that's making it non-porous, all right? So in the production of ceramics, this vitrification process is what makes a piece impermeable to the weather. Um, so in a ceramic situation, things have to be fired twice. You have to have a low fire than a high fire. Um, the bottom, bottom line in layman's terms is that glass and high fired vitrified ceramic can go outside. So um, your glass materials are, are very durable. Other more obvious stuff, pebbles, shells, you know, if they were out in nature, they're probably gonna be out okay outside. What we wanna watch for though are things that, particularly for you guys in the upper Northeast, there's gonna be some things that really don't weather well, including plates, unless they were vitrified, unless they were really high fired. So we'll come back to that. Um, so in our climate, and I have a lot of the same climate as you in, in uh, Washington, DC, so these materials must be rated for freeze thaw. So some obvious ones, high fire ceramic, um, unglazed porcelain, which is also a, a high fired ceramic, it just doesn't have a glaze on it. Stained glass, vitreous glass tiles, small tea, all those glass materials are surprisingly durable to go outside. So glass can go outside. And I mean, even the goofy stuff, like the glass baubles on the left, right? They're, they're glass, so they're non-porous. Your stained glass, your vitreous glass tires, your small tea, your millifluri. So how can I test for porosities? Um, fancy word for if it's water, water friendly for my purposes. So a really simple trick is to just have a spray bottle or to pour water on the back side of a ceramic tile. If it pools and drips off, then it's vitrified. If it soaks in, then that clay body isn't vitrified. So this test says, yeah, I can't go outside with this. It's not, and it isn't that you can't go outside with it. You don't want it to be outside 
during freeze thaw cycles. So you can make all kinds of wonderful things and put them outside, but put them on the porch in the winter. I mean, I, I move a lot of things onto my porch in the, in the foul months. It's that freeze thaw contraction and expansion that's creating the problem. So let's talk about some suitable substrates. So concrete products and wetty board type products and aluminum honeycomb are all very suitable for outside. So these concrete pavers, like that's a really great place to start because we can buy these at Home Depot Lowe's and they're already ready for us to start mosaicing. As is cement board, but this stuff is nasty. If you've ever used it, um, it's you gotta buy four foot by eight foot sheets. It's heavy, it's dirty, it's hard to cut. Where weedy and other products like this, and it's not that I'm a salesperson for weedy, it's, it's just one of many products. There's several products on the market now, uh, a go board, um, a hydro band is made by Laticrete. And the, a lot of these can go outside. I like wetty board because it already has this cementitious skin. So cementitious is just a fancy word for concrete, right? But this has no expansion or contraction, the wetty board. An aluminum honeycomb, that's more widely used in Europe. I have used it on um, jobs because the client was willing to pay for it. It's pretty expensive. It is the stuff that airplane um, wings are made of. It's a component. And this has no expansion or contraction. It is super strong and it's way lightweight. The trick with this is that you have to put a, a scratch coat on it because unlike this, like wetty board, this does not have a cementitious skin. It's an epoxy skin where this has a, a concrete skin. This has a concrete skin. This is already concrete. And we're marrying it to an adhesive that's a, a cementitious product. So we want those to work together. So like I was saying, if you just want to experiment and start getting your yayas out, these those precast pavers, I don't like to call them stepping stones because for what it costs you to make this, like you shouldn't be stepping on it. And if it's glass, it's slippery, right? So we don't really want to step on them. They're really meant to be a decorative item. But they're all ready for you to just start adhering to. Like here's a student work in progress. You can get different shapes. These are ceramic. This is actually stained glass. But there's lots of options with precast forms, okay? So um, you can go to a garden center and buy concrete forms. Now, I'm not an advocate of resin forms. I don't, I've never used them. My instincts say just don't go down that road. So I'm, I can't really speak to a resin form. You see a lot of resin shapes and things at garden centers. But this was a concrete bird bath. And my friend Julie, did a beautiful job of mosaicing this, used the proper adhesive thin set. And this is lovely. So you can get really nice shapes. If you're gonna go down this route, a couple of things about bird baths in particular, look for a really beautiful column because it's the money shot is really the column. Because when you think about it, so I've never mosaiced a bird bath because the inside, the bowl, is where they bathe, right? And so is, that, um, is there a danger to that for the, for the animal? Would they maybe get hurt if you had sharp edges? And you're always going to be scrubbing it. It's their bathroom. They shower in it. They poo in it. And so I'm not, I'm not too keen on actually mosaicing the inside of the bird bath, although lots and lots of people do. I'm just uh, giving you a heads up. It's a lot to keep clean. But this is magnificent. Can I ask you to stop for just a moment? Um, it sounds I'm like sorry, some yes. people are not able to, but some people are not able to see your slides. I am, um, but I just wondered if you could um, perhaps stop and then start sharing your slides again, just in case that solves the problem. I certainly will give it a try. All right, I'm going to stop share. So now you see me, right? And let's try yes, it again. I do. So does that work? Um, now I don't see your slides either. Oh, yes, there they are again. So, um, can I get a yes in the chat from those of you who didn't see the slides before? Are you seeing them now, Betty Ann and Frida? Yes, great. Thank you very much. I'm sorry to interrupt. Do you want me to go back one or two? 
No, that's all right. I think everyone could hear you. It was just okay. a question of some people missing okay. the visuals. Thanks. So, um, so these samples, so what I'm trying to do here is show you a bunch of different samples, okay, just so that this may um, give you some ideas. So the flower pot, right, whatever. We all like a pretty flower pot. So these are just very simple pots that were properly prepared. So understand that you can use just a properly prepared existing form. In this case, it's these terracotta pots. Just a heads up. The preparing may surprise you, and I have a YouTube channel, which I'll talk to at the very end. Um, our biggest video is about mosaicing a flower pot. Um, so just be, just know that it is a really, really good video, and I think you'll be really surprised about the tricks that go into doing this. That it's really well done. That being said, remember that porosity test I talked about. Terracotta pots are going to suck that water in, all right? So if you're going to do a terracotta pot, you definitely want to put it on the porch or cover it up in winter months. But you can make your own forms, all right? You, your forms just need to be cementitious. You need to make them concrete in some way. So I used to have a commercial studio, and my students and I made this. It was really pretty fun to make. It is a process that I learned from Sherry Warner Hunter. We're gonna talk about her in a moment. And Sherry really has perfected a process of using polystyrene, carving it, putting a concoction of cementitious stuff on it. And in the end, it comes out concrete. So this, this whole totem comes apart. It actually all fits into a small truck and the only piece I cannot pick up myself is the happy. Like that's how lightweight they are um, with this process that Sherry Warner Hunter has really perfected. So this piece is a sculpture that I did a number of years ago for a public artwork um, with a partner named Ali Mursky. And so I'm a big advocate of get the job and then figure out how you're gonna do it. Yeah, well, I got real nervous because I had only taken a couple of workshops with Sherry Warner Hunter. I was not hugely confident in doing the work. And so I actually made a maquette and uh, Sherry doesn't do this for very many people, but she actually fabricated this for me in her studio in Tennessee. And then we had it trucked to me in, in Virginia. So this is one of the steps. So she's gone over the polystyrene with her concrete concoction. There's actually irons at the bottom here and it's sitting on a piece of foam just to hold her up. But a trick with cementitious products is that they don't dry, they cure. And so they want to cure out pretty slowly. So if you've ever seen sidewalks being poured, you know, typically they're putting plastic over it or it's being wet for many days. And so this is what's happening here is she's very slowly curing out this figure. And then in the end, this is what it looked like. So we mosaic it with stained glass. Not all of it, some of it we actually left be the concrete, but Sherry made the perfect three-dimensional cementitious form of a sculpture that I had actually made um, just out of clay. And in the end, this was this installation, which was kind of weird. It was a really but ugly building. Like she's in the garden looking at this nebula, but um, we'll come back to this neb yeah, nebula. So, this job, when we first got it, I hired um, someone to come and help me figure out how to install it and what would be the best process. And um, that person was Matteo Randi, if you know him. He's, so he grew up in Ravenna, right? So he, he is the mosaic man. And he said, listen, you don't need to hire me to do this except to come and screw it into the wall. Don't build it on mesh or some other method. Just build it on a suitable substrate, you can do way more interesting things, and then basically we screw it up. So this entire installation of all the stuff on the wall only took like five hours to do, and it was such an insightful thing, because a couple other things happened. We were able to do all this interesting layering because of the substrate, and in this case, the substrate was that aluminum honeycomb, but it could have also been done in weedy. So it's kind of a, a big, interesting lesson. So these are our Weedy Board substrates and stained glass. These are actually some student works, just to give you some ideas. This is a really great 
second project. Yeah, we really want to try and do something for outside. Um, you know, a house number is utilitarian. Sometimes that's just where we want to put our head into something that's useful. This is a beautiful job. We just have to use Thinset. These I thought was really creative. Um, it was a hummingbird feeder. And so it's the same piece, it's got two sides. It, it kind of twirls in the wind by the front door. Totally cool. And then just got a piece of copper and went around the edge to reconnect it to the hummingbird um, feeder, which is no longer a feeder. But I thought that was a really, really cool thing to do. So let's talk about Smalty for a minute. It is the material of the gods. Many of us like to use it. So it's glass, right? It's an enamel glass, so it can, it can for sure go outside. So in Washington, D.C., we have um, a surprisingly large number of mosaics, of public art mosaics. And so this piece uh, is at a metro station, a public transportation center, and it's near the Anacostia River. And it's the, it tells the story of the river. It's by a local artist named Martha Jackson Jarvis, who really just does some um, very interesting out of, the, out of the norm stuff. But I, I just think this is a remarkable piece and you get all this beautiful texture going. Um, but Martha builds things flat in her studio. Let's be clear, she's not up on scaffolding building this stuff. Um, this is a piece that's in Mexico City. Uh, I, I really like this piece. It was designed by Diego Rivera, and um, there's a, there is a small tea factory in Mexico. There's only one in Mexico, in Cuernavaca. And when they first opened, it was in the mid 50s, and by the early 60s, they started doing all kinds of great public artwork, including this, which, no, none of you, I'm not going to do this, right? But I just love this photograph um, for a bunch of reasons. First of all, you got to love this, right? Look at that car in that trailer. But this is a, a theater, and this is all the way around. It's enormous, and it's just such a beautiful expression about what's going on inside the theater. Great picture. So back to Washington, D.C., this is actually uh, in Silver Spring, Maryland, which is just outside the Beltway, so to speak. And again, this is Martha Jackson Jarvis, and this is one of the most extraordinary exterior pieces that I've seen, and um, I find it really, really inspiring. It, it's, it's reminiscent of um, some of the other artists you have up in your neighborhood, like, like Deb Aldo, who's using lots of rocks and stuff. So this is, it's called Moon Dancing. It's enormous. You can see works, uh, work in progress photos of this. If you Google her and the title Moon Dancing, she actually built these individual panels on that cement backer board with that really heavy honking stuff. And I think in large part because of the weight involved, because there is some fabulous stuff going on in this piece, right? So rocks and stone and small tea and all kinds of crazy glass stuff. And it is just so beautifully expressive. It just speaks to, well, the sky's really the limit, no pun intended, um, when it comes to doing things. Uh, this is a very nice piece. This is in a garden. So it's a pretty large stepping stone. So it's 24 inches. So it's larger than what we would buy those precast pieces at, right? That, that we get at Lowe's or Home Depot. Because 24 inches is just too big of a span. So this was actually done in reverse with a, with a mold. And there's rebar running inside of it. So this, so Kim actually cast this. But it's a beautiful high fire ceramic. And there's a whole series of this in this uh, garden. Um, this piece is really um, extraordinary. So it's outside of a metro stop near where I live. And it's based on a painting by Sam Gillum, who's a, who was a painter and his, his thing was to interpret the folds in fabric. And so he gets this um, public art job, but he doesn't make mosaics. Who gets the job really is Stephen Miyoto. Right, so Stephen Miyoto is a very famous um, mosaic fabricator in Carmel, New York. And um, boy, they just knocked it out of the park with this. It was just so interesting. This piece is layered. It's on top, right? So think about maybe layering your exterior stuff, right? It gives it a whole different dimension. And you see there's a real mix of cuts and materials. And what's fascinating to me, a couple things, it's not grouted because some of it's small tea, big pieces of small tea, but then some of it's this yummy, awesome glazed ceramic in these colors that are just very unusual. I'm not quite sure where 
some of these came from. But I just think it's a, it's a magnificent, magnificent piece. And the construction of it is uh, really inspiring. So let's talk a bit more about this exterior rated substrates that work in combination with thin set because thin set mortar is your adhesive of choice. Um, and there's some caveats to that. It's not so easy where I live now to actually purchase exterior rated thin set. They don't carry it at Lowe's and Home Depot anymore because of the carcinogens. So I really, I have to get those products now from a tile distributor. So just um, make sure you're reading your labels, all right? Uh, and to the substrates, like we've said before, it's gonna be a weedy, this aluminum honeycomb, those pavers like we saw before, cement board. So this is why we like Weddy, right? This is not me, this is somebody, but like it's super lightweight. A lot of us are kind of on our own in this. And so I take that into consideration when I'm figuring out how I'm going to fabricate something. Because if I have to start moving stuff around my studio by myself, well, I'm not moving that concrete backer board. I'm just, I'm not, I can't physically do it. So, you know, and there's other similar products, right? Feather Core is one, this Go board. There's an interior version called Pro Panel. So there's lots of, of these products out there. And it's great because they can be cut with a jigsaw, right? Just this tool. A trick is you'll get a way nicer cut if you get yourself a, 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 a concrete bit. But they sell those at Home Depot. They're really easy. It's just a, it's a diamond bit. Cuts just like butter. But you can also cut wetty board with a box cutter if you're really in a, in a bind. But you can get all kinds of great elaborate shapes with your jigsaw. So in, in a pinch, you can also make your own version. So um, I've been, uh, I've had the incredible gift of teaching at Hacienda Mosaico in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico for the last eight years. And boy, who knows if 2021 is going to happen, right? And so I've been there a lot of times and I know what I can and can't acquire. And I only have a bag I can, I can bring down with me. So one year I had this bee in my bonnet. Well, I know I can get this foam. And I know I can take enough AR mesh tape and then I can kind of do what I learned from Sherry Warner Hunter. So this is insulation foam. Um, I can get this where I live in, in uh, Virginia. In Mexico, they use it widely for insulation. So you can get these nice two inch thick um, foam sheets, super easy to cut out. So we cut these mariachis out. Um, once I learned about that layering thing, I was kind of addicted to it. I do it all the time. I think it's a really interesting addition. Oh, excuse me. Turn that person off. Sorry about that. Um, so just to really uh, know that you can do this, all right? So we do sometimes build our own substrate. And so it was covered with AR mesh tape. You can see some remnants of it there. And then basically a couple of layers of thin set, all right? And then I had a pretty stable... Um, substrate and I knew that this was going to be screwed into the wall all right so I wasn't worried about the stability of it actually standing up like that sculpture I had done so the this was so the good news this turned out to be a freaking fabulous installation the bad news this took so much time um, I, I didn't think I was going to be able to do it in the time frame that I had it was really a lot of work that being said know that you can do it Right, and in the end, there's these happy guys singing at you. Um, so Weddy and similar products, they have some size challenges and you might wanna take that into consideration, all right? So you might have to join pieces. So this was a piece on the lower, not a hugely big piece. It was a client who didn't have enough money to pay me to mosaic the whole wall but I don't ever wanna walk away from somebody who wants a piece of artwork. I'd rather try and figure out what will work for them. And so she had this idea that she wanted this wavy starry night feeling. So I knew about Weddy and knew that I could cut these shapes and then just do something nice. The wall is painted, all right? And I had to take into account where the breaks were gonna be, right? But in the end, this is what this looked like with a little bit of a layer going on. Yeah, so who doesn't need that over their waterfall? On the other side of the wall was her pool. She was a nice client. 
So layers can be really interesting. So this is just a small piece. I really, this hangs on my house. I really like this little piece. You just need to plan for it. So how have I planned? A bunch of things. I have my wedding. Yeah, you have to deal with your edges, right? You have to figure out how to deal with that. And I've been educated about a product um, that you can actually paint on the edges, but the first thing it says on the bucket, not rated for exterior. Okay, so I can, I can put that on the edges if the piece is gonna be inside, but if the piece is gonna be outside, I have to wrap the edges in AR mesh tape. And there's a, I have a really good video about that on the YouTube channel, how you do that. And I have to mud it. The other thing you have to do with Weddy, or a lot of these products, you have to pre-engineer the hanging. So that's, that's a washer that, and on the reverse side is a D-ring. And then I had to kind of figure out who's going to get mosaic when I actually mosaic the flower and the leaves separate, engineered it so that I didn't mosaic behind here because that's just a waste of material. And I wanted a clean piece of the weedy under this so that I could just mud this on. I didn't want to screw this on. These are really lightweight pieces. So if they're lightweight, I don't feel compelled to screw them into the substrate. So um, let's talk about some indirect methods because I think they really come into play with exterior works because you could be building something all winter in your studio and now it's spring and then you can install it. You don't have to be weather dependent on actually doing the mosaic. And there's a couple of methods that are tried and true and I just wanna go through them real quick one at a time. Um, this is me making a change. I was on an installation and we had a raw measurement and we actually had two Egyptian women. And the only way I could fix it was I had to cut off one of the women and I'm redoing the edge um, in the middle of the night. So it's flexible. So a couple of things about all indirect methods is that you can build portions of a larger piece. So back here, you see this, these were columns for a playground pavilion. Right, so we were building all of the harder parts, face taping them, putting them in, putting them aside, getting all that hard work out of the way because I don't have an enormous studio. Once I had this laid out, that was gonna eat up the entire table space. So this allowed us, while I had staff, to get a bunch of work done without eating up all of the physical space and keeping us very much on track. The photo on the right, really like this photo the the factory at, uh, in Mexico gave this to me at Perdomo. So at the factory level, they almost always, and this is the, the same in Italy, uh, fabricate in the reverse method on brown paper. So we are seeing the back of the mosaic here, all right? This is, um, it sounds way harder than it is. It's actually really stable. And it's, this is what you got to do if you are using different thicknesses of materials and you want it flat. And they're doing, they do a lot of this um, in Italy and, and in Mexico at the factory level because they're fabricating public artworks and they do need to be uh, flat to the touch. It's a safety issue. So the face tape process, all right. Um, again, it sounds harder than it is. So I've got a pattern. I've got contact paper, right? Remember that good old brand. And I'm going to cover my pattern with contact paper sticky side up. I'm gonna build the mosaic. And after I build the mosaic, I'm gonna face tape it. And I have three different options on what kind of tape to use. This is a tape by a company called EMI, and it is proper ceramic face tape. So if I were doing something that were kind of a heavy gauge, ceramic, maybe quarter inch quarry tile, something really heavy, I would face tape with this. Kind of anything else, including stained glass, uh, inexpensive packing tape actually really works great. And you just do a quarter of an inch lap, overlap as you're working your way on the face taping. And as of late, I have been educated to the wisdom of using frosty contact paper, which um, Cynthia Fisher, is a advocate of and I and I've known this about her for years and we share a student who really talked to me about using this because this releases much easier than this and I'm going to come back to the why sometimes you want it to release 
and so so I hope to answer that. I plan to answer that question. So the method, right? This is a stained glass piece. This was um, an installation for a school, and it was all about um, iconic art, and they were using it for an art garden, right? So I have my contact paper paper sticky side down and I'm just laying the glass on top of it and the beautiful thing about that is it's so easy to make changes as I'm going if I change my mind I have the wrong color I didn't glue anything I'm not wasting materials because I glued it down and now I had to pry it off and maybe broke the piece when I changed my mind so this is another one of the pieces okay so like I talked about in a previous slide we could build pieces so here we're just building the head and it's very stable right it's face tape now lay that on and then build the rest of the piece around it and this is pretty big it's about four feet tall and i could fit it in my car right so i have this all face tape now it's really stable to transport and i'm not going to cut it apart until i'm on location because I have to cut it apart in a few places because it's a little bit too big for me to handle on my own. So in general, when we're doing an indirect method, I find that more than about a square foot or 18 inches is about as much as I can physically handle actually getting it up on the wall or getting it into the floor and managing all the other stuff that goes with that, lining it up to a previous piece, making sure it's fully seated. Um, so that's just kind of a, a rule of thumb that comes from the tile trade. Um, but here he is in place, right? And of course, I want, never want to make my life simple, so he's being grounded a bunch of different colors. You can see here the mud from behind. And the theory is when you face tape is that you don't remove the tape until the adhesive sets. So on this particular installation, we put the pieces up and then we went home. And then the next day, we peeled all the tape off. And so there he is in live and in, in place. And this was the final installation. It was, it was kind of cool that a school would actually pay for this. So another method, so one more thing, back up about the face tape method. It really only works if your materials are about the same thickness. There could be a little bit of a difference, but not a lot. If you have a bigger difference in height, another technique that's really, really effective to do is, is it's called the mesh method. So in this piece, these are from my friend, Allie Morsky. She's incredibly talented. She lives near me in Maryland. You can see here, she's working over a photograph. So how easy is that? Well, she's skilled, but it's easy, right? She can see exactly where she's got to go with things, and she's gluing onto this mesh with the same adhesive she's going to install with. In the end, this is what the piece looked like. But what kind of blew me away about this, she lives in Maryland. These went to Texas, and she never went to Texas with them. So she had these measurements, and then the homeowner had a local installer put these pieces in. So how great is that? Um, it's it, it's a great way to send things. A real advantage to the mesh method is that you're seeing exactly what the materials are gonna look like, right? So just um, a quickie review. I'm not working over a cartoon here. I was just fooling around. I was making a polka dot, and you'll see why in a moment. Um, I'm just squirting some thin set that I have in a baggie, a great trick for thin set management. And I'm building these little flowers. And so you can see I have my, my circle, which is my pattern, for lack of a better word, a piece of plastic, and then the mesh. And the mesh doesn't need to be taped down thoroughly because as soon as you start putting down your, your materials, it's, it's going to, to weight it down. And so a lot of people made polka dots, right? This was, uh, you'll see these calls on Facebook pretty often. Um, People were doing, so a fabulous one happened in Orlando, uh, uh, Sherry Bocera was doing after the Pulse nightclub um, massacre, uh, a beautiful piece and everyone was making hearts of different colors and mailed them to her. So this, my friend Kim Wozniak in Pulaski, Wisconsin, did the polka dot project, the Pulaski polka dot project. And so polka dots came from all over the world. It was really very cool. Different materials, stained glass, sweeties, all different things and then they installed them on the building right so they're using thin set 
just kind of figuring out where they want them. And in the end, this is what they had. So it was um, really fun. I, I did my polka dot. I didn't, I didn't go help with the installation. So a trick, right? They got all the polka dots up and then they did do direct onto the wall, the field. And that's all glass vitreous tiles. But like, that's pretty fun. You know what's going on inside of that building. The reverse method on brown paper, all right? So I have a really good video about this and it shows you and gives the exact recipe for making the paste. And um, I was really intimidated by this process for years and then finally took a deep breath and said, I gotta figure this out. Oh, because I had a job that required that I did that um, by necessity. So a um, couple of tricks about it, but again, it's not hard. So we're gonna go back to my buddy, Ali Mursky, because she did this piece in the reverse method. It just blew me away. First of all, it was her first piece in the reverse method. And this was just a couple of years ago. Because what happens with the reverse method is you're gonna glue your tessera face down on brown paper with a, with a simple flour paste. So you're only seeing the back of your tessera. And some materials are really different front and back, right? Um, these smalty pebbles, iridized, they look different on the other side. Mexican smalty is very different each side of the skin. So it's a bit of a leap of faith, all right, in some materials. You can get a sense of the size. Here's the paste. The paste actually has about a two week shelf life uh, in the refrigerator. And uh, she's just gluing along here. Here they are installing it. Um, I'm not quite sure where she cut it. I'm sure that she did. And then what's happening here is once you put it down, you're soaking the paper off right away um, with sponges. And in the end, this was the piece. It was pretty awesome obviously engineered to set into the floor. I know it's not an exterior piece, but it is that same idea. So um, thin set mortar, the adhesive of choice, of choice always is for, um, for exterior works is always um, thin set mortar. You really wanna read the label, make sure it's polymer fortified. Um, if not, you need to buy the polymers and make sure it's rated for your environment. This stuff is pretty great. I have some friends who don't like it at all, uh, and so for interior works where I want to use thin set, I do use this. Um, but the first thing it says on the label is not rated for outside. But for interior pieces, it can be helpful. So those pesky edges, this is what I mean. So you're going to take AR, alkaline resistant mesh tape, which you can get at Home Depot. This is what Weddy says you're supposed to do. All right. And I know it's a pain in the neck. And then we cut these strips and we mud them down here and we mud the side. Now when it's dry, these are tile ready. I can tile the edges. I can just put mortar on them. It will accept it because really not much is gonna stick into this polystyrene. I mean, you could shove some paint in there, but over time it's, it's gonna probably peel off. The annoying hanger, you gotta do the hanger in advance. Um, I would not put it there. I would put it a little closer down. Um, and then on the flip side, you're putting a D ring. And so, so you can buy these typically wherever you buy, buy Weddy. If you're just buying sheets from a mosaic supplier, they're probably gonna charge you about three bucks for a set of these. And just know at a tile distributor, I can buy a box of 100 for $11. So, you know, if I'm gonna make three pieces, I've already paid for my box of 100. So I think, um, particularly when you're first starting, like with all mosaics, because you're using thin set for outside, if you haven't used it before, I would just recommend keeping the design simple at first because it's a challenging adhesive. It's not hard. It's just different than if what you're used to is a white PVA glue. It's just a pretty simple design. Um, I'm cutting and I'm laying. Uh, I'm trying to work pretty neat, you know, so I'm trying to keep my interstices clean. You always want to clean up your mud. Um, like if I'm going to go to bed, I got to clean that up because tomorrow that's concrete and it's a real bear to chip off, all right? It's, and so I'm all about not causing needless work. And in the end, that's what this piece ended up being. So kind of a nice, charming uh, little exterior something. So anyway, that's kind of it, my, my overview. Know that when I teach exterior mosaics in a weekend format, it's two and a half days. That's how much time we take to do things um, because I want that last half day to just be our grounding day. Um, 
you know, mosaics take time. We all, we all get that, right? Um, please do go to the YouTube channel. I share that with Kim Wozniak. If you just go to YouTube and start typing in mosaic tips, Bonnie, there's a good chance I'll, I'll come up. And uh, yeah, subscribe, it, it helps us a lot. But we have about uh, 40 videos up that uh, a lot of them talk about managing thin set, about those pesky edges, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, for workshops, which at this point in time are not in person, I'm sorry to say. Um, and I also lead art-filled travel tours. Um, look me up on mavericosakes.com. And there we go. Thank you. So I'm going to stop my share so you can see me. Does that make sense? That's great. You Thank me? you so much, Bonnie. Um, sure. So we have a number of questions that have been um, gathered. I, okay. Uh, I'm not sure if you prefer to see me. I can turn on my video if you'd like me to, but why don't I just start off by saying that um, when you first showed us that nebula, um, you got yeah. a lot of compliments on it in the chat box. So th that, oh, that was well done. Yeah. Um, okay, the first question we had was, can you use epoxy sculpt outside? Oh, epoxy sculpt, right? It changes your life. Yes. It's from what I, yes, you can, I use it a lot, actually. Let's say I did something outside and I screwed it into the wall. Mm -hmm. I'll use epoxy sculpt to attach that last tessera that's going to cover the annoying washer ah. for a couple of reasons. If I want to thin set the piece on, I have to put a piece of AR mesh over that washer so that I'm making it cementitious friendly. But if I just have epoxy sculpt, bam, wham, thank you, man, I glue that piece of tesser on and it dries really quickly right so then i can do whatever grout patch i need to do like in in an hour and then i can go home i don't have to go back so yes epoxy sculpt all right great yeah. um you also you mentioned um that you learned about a new product to paint on the edges of maybe mm. if it's not exterior can you tell us the name of that yeah it is called oh boy it's a laticrete product I might have to send it to you in writing to send to everybody. I'm just having a senior moment. Um, Prime and Bond is what it's called. And Bond, great. Prime and Bond, and you paint it on. Um, the bad news is, yeah, you might want to pull your funds. You have to buy like five gallons. That's the minimum. <laughs> but it's not terribly expensive. The five gallons was like $50. So if you split it among five friends, then you'll just own a big bucket of it. True. Well, luckily we have a whole mosaic society here, so we can all share. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So um, we had another question about when you do the layered work, particularly those large, um, those larger pieces. How do mm -hmm. you attach the layers together? And that question oh, came great, before great question. about mudding on the small piece. Yes. Yeah, so sometimes it kind of depends on the piece. Um, if it's if it's kind of a heavy layer, physically heavy, uh, we'll engineer it so that we're gonna actually screw it and go all the way through to the wall, right? So we'll, 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 we just have to engineer for that. If it's a little goober, we'll just mud it on, we'll just glue it on. I have, um, on my website, there's a, a picture I use all the time of a, a, a katina, a, 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 a woman's skeleton, right? It's in Mexico, and she's lots of layers. But none of those layers were so heavy that we actually had to screw them in. We just glued them on with more mud, right? Because wetty to wetty with the exterior rated thin set is going to marry just fine. Great. Um, so some people had questions about that mudded on term and just wanted to clarify that. Um, it's that just slang. Meant and that what you mean by mudding it on is, is yeah. that thin set. Yes. So that that's correct. So there. Yes, that is correct. So it's just it, it's just um, it's you know hanging out with those tile setters. They just call it mud. Okay, great. Um, someone was wondering about the grouting process and whether there's any difference for exterior work. Well, there is. Great question. So some folks like Sherry Warner Hunter, they use epoxy grout, which. Um, and in Sherry's case, often it's because they're public works, particularly with kids, right? An epoxy grout is challenging 
because it is two big honking bags. It's two components. You put them together and, you know, it's kind of dangerous and it's toxic and stuff. So for me, I find a middle ground is to use um, a top of the line product I get from Laticrete called Permacolor. Mape makes something very similar. So what's in that? It's loaded with other polymers that are making it stronger. And it's got some important other things in it, like an antibacterial, a sealant. So gee, I have that bird bath or I have a water feature. You're gonna get effervescence over time from water staining, right? Our water's all hard. So um, I find that using one of those amped up grouts works better for exterior and always sanded. I, I only use sanded grout. Okay. Um, so when you were talking about the mesh that you use mm -hmm. as a, uh, on some projects, there was a question about whether that's ever a sticky mesh. Oh, you know, it's not. And so I have had limited exposure to the sticky mesh. I, I get the, the theory of it. Um, I just um, prefer to stay kind of in the building trades world. And so that the mesh I'm using, and you can buy that from mosaic suppliers, um, like Woodsend sells it. Um, and it's not like the first time I was gonna do the mesh method, I actually went to Joann's and bought rug, rug hooking mesh, eh, wrong. Um, you, you need that alkaline resistant mesh. Um, and I know that the sticky mesh is, but it's got some adhesive on there. And so my concern is with the mesh, why we use the same adhesive to glue our tesser onto the mesh as what we plan to um, adhere it to in its final place is that's all compatible and I'm not making a barrier, right? So you're putting just a little bit on your tessera and, and gluing it to the mesh because we want that, that next batch of adhesive to come up enough because in theory, your adhesive comes up 25% up the side of your material, your tessera, whatever that is. So that's, oh, that's pretty manageable in ceramic. That's really tough in stainless, mm -hmm. you know, so yeah, that makes sense. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, but it's that, that, so I, I, I don't, I don't, I'm concerned about the sticky mesh creating an unwanted barrier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another question was, how do you seal the edges on concrete board? So on the cement board rather than weedy? Yeah, great question. So I haven't done that because I so loathe that material because it's <laughs> so heavy. But I would think just to keep it clean and tidy, I'd probably do the, the mesh tape. Hmm. Because when you cut that, that uh, cement backer board, it's really crumbly inside. It's kind of weird. Uh, another product that um, is out there is Hardy Backer Board, also makes a cement product. But there's lots of hardy backer board out there. So you have to make sure that you're getting one that is rated for exterior. Not, it, not, it is not all rated for exterior. That edge cuts a little neater, a little cleaner. Okay. Um, so we have a question about um, the, um, seeing a lot of mirror in some of the pictures for exterior work. So the question was, do you seal the mirror at all so that it doesn't desilver with the elements? Yeah, yeah. So I personally don't use mirror. Like my feeling is, I, let's just go for the gold, you know, um, just use gold spalty or, or white gold. The a challenge with mirror is that, I, that it's going to patina over time. I think no matter what, it may be 20 years. Um, so like Laurel True, she uses mirror all the time and, and it's really labor intensive because she does it correctly. You have to seal the back and you have to seal the edges. Mm -hmm. And so there is a product, right? Mirror sealant comes in spray can, you can spray it. But I've been told by guys at window and mirror companies that it's just shellac and that way cheaper and not spraying so in the winter, you don't want to be spraying that adhesive inside your studio. You could just use shellac on the back side, but you also have to hit those edges because that silver does not like the thin set mortar. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it reacts. And so that's where you get that patina. 
look. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so for, the, oh, all right, here's one more, one more question from other people and then I have a question of my own and we'll see what else comes in. So um, here's a, oh, lots of questions. So Frida is wondering, um, she's making a table with half inch concrete board. And so she wants to clarify, are you suggesting that she put mesh tape on the edges and then tile the edges using thin set just like she'll do on the top surface? Oh, that's a tough one because uh, I think if it's clean, I would not invest, the, if it's a clean cut, I don't know that I want to invest a lot of time doing those edges because it's really uh, labor intensive. Mm -hmm. A challenge for me with tiling the edges of a table is that that's a real heavy traffic area, unless it's a decorative table, right? We're putting our elbows on the table. Um, we move the table, we hit, we hit the corner on the wall. So, um, so ju I'm just throwing that out there. I'm just, I'm more of an advocate of finding something else, um, you know, a, a piece of copper, a metal strip or something that could edge that out because nothing's going to happen to that concrete board. It's right with the weather. It's more an aesthetic thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. In, in that case. Um, all right, so there's a question about the fireplace that you showed in your slides, and the question is whether it was inset or attached, and which you would suggest? I think that they were inset, but they were probably also attached. So I, because they were kind of big-ish, um, so if, I, if they were my pieces, I would have said to the installer, oh, and I want you to put two screws in, and I'm going to send you the pieces that you're going to, adhere right on top of those screws, whether epoxy sculpt or whatever. Um, I would just feel better about doing that, but they do appear to be inset and they actually appear to have um, some sort of really lovely kind of frame that was probably a ceramic uh, edge piece mm -hmm. around them. Mm -hmm. It was really beautifully done. Great. Um, Buzz is wondering, have you used glass with a colored coating on the backside and would you use that in exterior work? That's a great question. I have not. So like Van Gogh glass, things like that. Now I know folks who have, students who have, because they really like the look going into it. So, but I'm not sure how it weathered. Um, a suggestion is to make a little test something and then throw it in your freezer for a couple months. Mm. And, and periodically take it out, throw it in the freezer for a couple days, take it out, let it defrost, anything happen to it throw it back in the freezer force that um freeze thaw cycle and just <laughs> see what starts to happen like expedite what mother nature would do to it mm -hmm. okay um uh, we have a question could you remind us the name of the artist who created moon dance that you shared uh, martha Jack jackson jarvis great or martha jarvis jackson i think it's martha jackson jarvis Google will tell um, us. Yeah, so she, you know, she's in Washington D.C. She is not a member of SAMA. She doesn't hang out with Mosaic people. She's been at this for a long time. Um, when I first was involved with SAMA, was uh, was only they were only existed for three years, and she actually was a juror on at the SAMA exhibition in Washington D.C. And that wow. was like a long time ago. Um, <laughs> yeah. But she's she's extraordinary. I think she's uh, that moon dance piece just blows me away. Yeah, thanks for sharing those. Um, okay, we have a very practical question here. Um, if you were mosaicing a cinder block wall, do you have to seal the wall first? I do not think so. What you might think about doing, depending on the joints, like you know, sometimes you'll see a, a block wall, and then it's got kind of a divot, the mortar that's holding all the blocks together. You might want to put a scratch coat of thin set on it, just super thin, in part so that you're getting rid of that divot. And now I've got a really nice marrying the same to the same. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't, but you don't need to seal it because it's already concrete. It's already cementitious. Yeah. Um, all right, so we are getting close to an hour. Um, I had a question of my own, which is in that, in that, um, woman sculpture that Sherry Warner Hunter helped you with the, the substrate for. Um, you said there were brackets on the bottom. 
I was curious what those brackets got yeah. attached to in the ground. Well, the brackets actually were, they were iron, uh, L irons, I think they're mm -hmm. called. Yeah. And that actually went all the way up to her head. So mm -hmm. in there was a, a welded armature that mm -hmm. went up to her head and the arm came out that held the telescope. So inside the telescope is an armature. Mm -hmm. So those uh, uh, tire irons, that's what they're called. That's what the bracket was that was sticking out. And, and they so stuck out about 20, I think 18 inches mm -hmm. so that we could actually set her into a void in the ground that had quick setting concrete in it. And those, those irons are what keep her standing should there be really high winds or a kid hang on her or something. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, all right, we've got a thank you message, but no other questions for the moment. I think we're starting to get a lot of thank yous. Um, I really appreciate everything you were able to share with us. And I think um, Amy might have some closing remarks. Um, okay but I'll say thank you, thank you. Well, you're very welcome, I appreciate it. I just, you know, these are tough times, folks. Just keep creating, that's all I can say. Just figure it out, you know, and, and if you have questions, send, you know, send me notes and I'm happy to try and help you figure stuff out and, um, and we'll take it from there. Wonderful. Um, Amy, did you have something to say before we, we, we finish up? I just wanted to say thank you for a wonderful presentation and, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we, we've recorded it, so it will be available on our website. Thanks again. You bet, so thank you everyone. Have a good night and uh, stay safe. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.